Price. That's the number one technical indicator. You do best by investing for the longer term. If you can't explain what the business is doing, then that is a huge red flag. Some technological change is going to put you out of business. It really is a genuinely extraordinary situation. Hello, everyone. I'm Ed Gotham, and welcome to Opto Sessions where we interview the top traders and investors from around the world and covering their secrets to success. Today, I welcome Robert Campwell, the founder of Upholdings and the Compound Kings ETF, ticker KNGS. Upholdings was started to make high-quality growth investing available to more investors. The Kings ETF is the first hedge fund ever to convert into an actively managed ETF, giving retail investors the opportunity to do just that. The goal of Compound Kings is to invest in compounders, companies generating cash and reinvesting at a higher rate of return than the overall market. Using a crack team, Upholdings performs intensive research on another level when compared to other fund managers, combining both qualitative and quantitative data in an effort to beat the S&P 500. On the show, we deconstruct the King's ETF and its current holdings, the benefits of a concentrated portfolio, why investing in China is not a binary decision, and if now is the right time to be investing in innovation. Enjoy. Hi, Robert. It's great to have you on the show. How are you doing today? Hey, Ed. Great to be with Opto. And um, are you calling from Nashville, Tennessee today? Is that right? I am. I assume it's pretty hot there at the moment. I, I've not been there myself. Hot and humid. You know, we'll take it hot and wet. <laughs> um, and yeah, obviously, we're here today to discuss the markets and also go into detail on, on your, your company upholdings and its ETF, um, Compound Kings. So, the compounders element is obviously a, a big, big part of the ETF and how, how you know the whole thing came together. Can you briefly like take us through uh, what are compounders so, that, so we can learn about this? Sure, and I'll give a little intro on them, and we'll go much deeper into it uh, as as we go through the interview today. But at, at the simplest level, a compounder is a, a business that is in a very large industry that has companies that have defensible positions. Uh, so the, those are high market share players in an industry that is growing and has reinvestment opportunities for the leading players in it. So that's the first criteria. Uh, the second is you have a management team that is operationally excellent. And there's a lot of different features to there being a great management team. That means great products. That means great shareholder management uh, and a host of other things. And then the third piece of it is the price has got to be right. So the only way to earn an excess return off of owning a great company is not overpaying for it. So if you get the industry right, you get the management team right, and you get the price right, you have a chance of uh, finding some pretty strong returns. Yep. And obviously, the market is, uh, is a lot of high PE ratios at the moment. Um, what, what, what's your viewpoint on um, equities that are overvalued? Sometimes uh, the best equities you know, will be overvalued. And you know, probably for quite some time, or might go through periods that they you know, become undervalued. How do you determine if they are still you know, a valid investment, you know, based on their growth potential, et cetera. How do you approach that? One of the things I really enjoy about being a public market investor is we have an incredibly large lake to fish from. And uh, it is rare that all equities all at the same time are overvalued. And I believe equities are one of the best securities for growing wealth and income long term. Uh, there are other folks that do bonds or do leveraged buyouts and things like that. But public equities present lots of opportunities. So I think that question gets very nuanced because there are times when uh, small cap companies are overvalued and large cap is undervalued. There's times when large cap is overvalued and you know small cap isn't. And we've found ourselves both moving across geographies, moving across company sizes, less commonly moving across industries. Uh, and you know we'll go to wherever the market is giving us the best opportunities. And so to answer your question a little bit more specifically, large cap companies today are about as fairly priced as we've seen them in a very long time. Uh, mid cap companies are a bit overpriced, and a lot of the small cap emerging growth players are outrageously priced. So a fund like ours that had a lot of small and mid cap names in it 18 months ago now is almost entirely comprised of large cap. That's very names. interesting. And, and how how do you um in terms of the valuation, 
how are large cap, what, what sort of metrics are you using to determine the valuation and if they're fair, undervalued or overvalued? Well, eventually, uh, every company has got to deliver a solid free cash flow yield. And the amount of variability around the, that company's free cash flow generation uh, has an effect on the amount of multiple uh, investors are willing to pay for it. So we're always, we're always modeling five to 10 years out. We certainly can't predict what's going to happen five to 10 years from today. Uh, so when we're drilling back in and looking today, there's a number of different metrics we'll look at and different businesses require different metrics. If we're looking at a real estate business, we're looking at how it's trading to book value. If we're looking at a growth company that has a lot of investments that are buried in its operating expenses, uh, there's a ratio we like of focusing on gross profit minus marketing because there's a lot of young companies that can pump revenue and pump gross profit, uh, but sometimes they're doing so by yeah. pumping marketing. So gross profit minus marketing is, is a really good indicator for uh, early business models that are penetrating and disrupting um, uh, larger incumbent players in the industries that they're in. So between book value, between a gross profit minus marketing multiple, and then for the really big guys, you're able to use free cash flow multiples. Uh, those are probably the three most common uh, valuation metrics we'll look at. Brilliant. And can you take us through um, upholdings and the ETF, obviously, as well, and how it's innovating in the retail investor space? For sure. Upholdings is a federally registered investment advisor, which is the technical designation. Uh, but really what we are is a research team. And all of the, uh, the team today is, is myself and two analysts. Uh, one is very qualitative and focuses, spends a lot of time in transcripts and meeting with customers and talking to experts. Uh, the other is really a data scientist. The internet has opened up a wealth of data and information. And I don't believe any investor can properly navigate being a public market investor without having both a quantitative and qualitative a team to help inform their decisions. So Upholdings is a research house. Now, historically, there have been a number of different ways that investment firms have uh, chosen to offer access to their investment strategies. Some firms might actually just sell the research to other investment firms. Most firms will launch a private fund, which is a hedge fund, which is the most unregulated investment vehicle you can offer. Now, the challenge with a hedge fund is you can do anything you want, and there's basically no rules around the marketing of it, except that you can only sell that fund to accredited or qualified investors, which are folks that already have a million dollars, already have more than $5 million. And one of the things that really frustrated me about the retail investment market when I was coming out of Everlane was that if you're already rich, there's a great set of investment choices out there. Uh, but if you're not, the list is actually quite thin. There are low-cost, heavily diversified index funds, which by themselves are an incredible product. But outside of that, we didn't see a heck of a lot of innovation outside of that. So we said, hey, instead of just doing whatever else is doing and opening a hedge fund uh, to operate, um, uh, to pursue the investment ideas that come out of the research team that we have, why don't we make this a publicly available investment vehicle? So we had our private fund that we managed for about 18 months built up a pretty strong track record there. And uh, back at the end of December, we flipped that into a publicly traded, actively managed uh, ETF. So the Compound Kings ETF is the only fund that we're managing today. Uh, it's available to today, any US investor with a brokerage account or any international investor that uses a brokerage account like Interactive Brokers uh, that allows them to uh, purchase ETFs on international exchanges. Uh, it is not yet available to investors that are outside of the U.S. using non-U.S. or non-internationally enabled brokerages. Yeah, that's really interesting actually to see your approach to that because uh, well, as a retail investor yourself, you know, I've had a lot of interest in ETFs um, and like ETFs a lot, but a lot of them, even the really popular ones, you know, like TAN, the solar ETF, et cetera, um, don't really have any active management or any sophisticated means of how those companies are chosen, selected for the ETF. They're just simply an industry category group up of these things. You got it. And this, this is the challenge with the, the way in which the ETF market is segmented today. So a little bit of history on this. You had actively managed mutual funds, which were uh, in the 70s and 80s, you know, the number one way that uh, access to uh, retail investment management was distributed. Um, 
at some point in the, the mid 80s, they started developing these index funds that were originally distributed in mutual funds. Um, now, the index funds were actually the first to really experiment with the ETF vehicle because they were so focused on driving fees down as low as possible. You had this index boom, which a lot of it I ascribe to the fact that the index-based companies were some of the first and early adopters of ETFs. Had the actively managed mutual fund sponsors out there been as aggressive in moving their portfolios and their managers and their strategies into ETFs, I don't think you would have seen nearly the lopsided allocation that's gone into index-based funds versus active management over the last 15 mm -hmm. years. We are now at the very beginning stages of that changing. So actively managed ETFs are the smallest segment of the ETF universe, but the fastest growing. And a number of these large mutual fund managers are finally getting their act together and at a minimum saying, well, geez, for taxes alone, we need to move our, our mutual fund investors into these ETF vehicles and we can bring our strategies and securities and everything with us. The T. Rose and some of the bigger firms, they're pursuing a non-transparent approach. It's not got a lot of legs to it. It's probably going to fade over time. Uh, Kathy Wood has demonstrated the power of having well-architected funds. Uh, she's all over the internet. So you know all the time what she's doing. And I think that's set the bar for active managers of what they've got to do. If you want to manage a publicly traded fund, you've got to be out there. You can't be hiding what you're yeah. doing. You have to be sharing and explaining and having what you're doing tested by the market at large. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, and yeah, a very exciting time then for, for retail investors, really, getting access to you know things that they wouldn't have done before. What's cool is that I, I do think we're, uh, we're in the early renaissance of a lot more of these active managers being out there in public vehicles. And what's so cool is that retail investors are going to get the choice. And we have one strategy today in Compound Kings. It is an extremely concentrated fund. Uh, we're taking, we've got five positions that make up more than 50% of our fund. I mean, that is, that is a level of concentration that I don't see in any other funds out there. But that's what active managers are built to do. We're built to do immense amount of research around industries and individual companies. And, and you know, fingers crossed, we're excited to see other active managers you know, following our path with other strategies that are pursuing uh, other ways of uh, potentially delivering uh, great returns to uh, individual investors. And how does your experience as an operator differentiate the Compound Kings ETF? So this was another thing coming out of Everlink. Real briefly, my background, I, I spent the first eight years of my career in institutional investment management, uh, mostly with a private equity firm, and then a couple of years with a long, short hedge fund. Uh, all the while, we were, we were focused on businesses where the internet was changing business models. Um, I had the, the opinion at the time that if I really wanted to be a great investor one day, I'd have to actually build a company. And a coworker of mine, Michael Praisman, moved out to San Francisco, started a company, Everlane. Uh, which was one of the first uh, direct-to-consumer brands online. It was founded around the same time as Instagram. I don't think that's a coincidence. And we, we built a multi-hundred million dollar brand entirely online. Uh, that brand is big enough to now operate stores. And I'll, I'll tell you, it, as an investor, you learn a lot about how, uh, how much industries can affect the opportunities that companies have to grow. But as an operator, you learn how insignificant financials are to the success of the company. And so much more of the time is spent around product positioning and hiring and recruiting and driving these internal operational KPIs that are rarely the same metrics that investors are looking at. You know, the income statement, the cash flow mm -hmm. statement, those are just the report cards that come out of high-performing, well-executing teams. And so that was then coming back... Um, uh, into investment management again after Everlane, it was I, I came at it with a with a new lens uh, over the eyes of understanding what the operators inside these businesses are thinking about, and it and frankly it's tightened my uh, threshold on the companies that I'm willing to own, because there are a lot of management teams out there that are on short term contracts that are not acting in the long term interests of shareholders that are pursuing revenue at all costs, and we're not going to take high revenue growth for the sake of high revenue growth. You know, we're out there focusing on companies that are building sustainable positions 
that are going to be able to crank margin out of that revenue that they're generating. And I think without having been an operator, I, I wouldn't be in the same position of being able to separate between those two types of businesses. Yeah. That's really interesting, obviously, because the research strategy at Upholdings appears to be, you know, where you go above and beyond and, you know, one of your differentiation areas, you know, including customer interviews and going in much more depth. Can you take us through that process and, and how your team is important to its success? Sure. So as I mentioned at the beginning, I, I do think, you know, we've got a data scientist on the team that is, uh, I view it as connecting the, the waves of information across all these companies. So we can't just, you can't just follow a company. If you're following a company, you've got to follow the industry and their competitors in it uh, to understand what's happening. And so the, at, at the highest level, we're very focused on industries that we like, social media, uh, enterprise software, payments, uh, and a couple others. And then secondarily, we're very focused on what are the market share changes that are happening within those industries and how are those individual companies positioned? And so that's, that's really at the, at the data level of sifting through what's happening within each of these industries. Now, when we're actually drilling in, because you can't just buy a company off of high-level metrics like that, when you're drilling in and figuring out whether or not an individual company is worthy of investment, we've got to talk to the customers. You've got to talk to the competitors. There's no better way, you know, Warren Buffett you know, famously said one time, he said, I can buy stock in a company without ever talking to a single person that's worked there because I've talked to someone that works at all 12 of their competitors. And I know that I learned more about them from talking to their competitors and I would learn from hearing from them promoting you know, their own initiatives and things like that. Um, so I do think that that, that scuttlebutt approach uh, is, is very important. Uh, and then the, the final and last piece of the puzzle is valuation. So you, know, you start at the high level, the data science, you boil the ocean, you figure out where the opportunities are, you drill into specific businesses that seem like they've got a chance of, of breaking through and gaining additional market share in the years to come. But then you've got to put a model around that and say, well, what are you willing to pay to participate in that opportunity? And what kind of return are you going to get? And you know, we're greedy. We want double digit returns on equity uh, and the investments that we make. And so we've got to be really careful about the multiples that we're willing to enter uh, these opportunities with. Yep. And you mentioned earlier, about how important the teams were, or are, sorry, to you know, the success of any equity. How do you go into depth and find the management teams that are, you know, well, maybe that it's, you know, you can quite easily find out if they're still founder-led, but are there other things you start, start looking at to see if they're incentivized in the right way to deliver long-term value? Yeah. Uh, founder-led is a pretty good one, but there's almost this like bad category of founder-led mm where there's like high executive turnover. <laughs> right. <laughs> because founders can be both a, a great thing, uh, but they can also hold companies back for a long time because they often are in like de facto control positions. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, if they are not willing to be properly checked, uh, they will take the business into a direction that investors are, have no interest in the business going. And you can sit around for five years while you know, nothing is happening to the stock price. So yes, I, I agree with you that uh, we tend to prefer founders being involved over not being involved. Uh, but there are also what, what I would describe as managers that act like founders. And I think that's really what you're looking for because whether or not they were there, you know, at the inception of the business, uh, they often can still act in the long-term interests of shareholders. So uh, what are examples of that? Uh, examples of that are, uh, management teams that are really thoughtful around share buybacks. Uh, so they're not buying back all the time, but they're buying back when their share price has gotten beaten up for a few quarters because, well, so uh, Netflix is a, is, a, is a nice example because their, their stock hasn't done that well over the past year. Their subscriber additions have slowed. We tend to look at a business like Netflix, not over a one or two year period, but over a 10 year period looking backwards and over a 10 year period looking forwards. I can't tell you when it's going to happen, but Netflix will certainly experience a reacceleration in subscribers mm -hmm. again. I don't know if it's going to happen next year. I don't know if it's going to happen in a couple of years, uh, but it's going to happen. If you look at the, their market share of content, and one of the stats we really like with Netflix is they continue to increase the number of individual studios for which they are the sole buyer. So if you look at 
you know, Netflix's position as what is their market share of the content that they're acquiring? Well, shit, they're becoming an exclusive content provider to an increasing number of studios. And that's an incredibly strong competitive position that, you know, the ebbs and flows of what's happening in industry, you know, paid subscription media right now is not the hottest thing in the world for whatever reason that's pertaining to, you know, COVID uh, rocking different parts of the world. Uh, but as long-term investors, like we're seeing a chance to now start to buy shares again in the company that we really like. Uh, so the, the, now this was an example, the original question was about management teams. And, and that's an example where you still have a founder running the company. Um, but what Reed is doing there, I mean, they purchased $500 million of shares back in the second quarter. And that's the management team saying, we still believe in what we're doing. And we're not just going to take investor capital and start throwing it at new opportunities for the sake of it but we're going to reinvest in our own business you know, when we see that it makes the most sense. And in terms of portfolio positioning, um, you, you mentioned already that concentration is one of your sort of strategies. Why is that important? Well, if you're an active manager and you're not concentrated, I don't think you're doing your job. Now, there's a whole world of uh, quantitative only, uh, sometimes referred to as black box investing, uh, which is much more of a mathematical exercise. Uh, that to me, that's just a fundamentally different business. In that business, you're hiring mathematicians, you're developing algorithms, you're finding pricing inefficiencies in the market, and it requires thousands of securities for you to um, uh, for you to capture you know that arbitrage. In the research business, uh, the the quality of your research should enable a very high level of concentration because investors have a tremendous number of alternatives. They can buy a Vanguard growth fund. They can buy a Vanguard mid cap fund. They can buy the S and P 500. Uh, they could buy, you know, the MSCI China index. And we are competing against indices. You know, we, we, we are not operating in a vacuum here. So the best chance that we have of outperforming any of these indexes is to take heavily concentrated positions into the securities that we like the best. There's a second piece that I'll add to this, which is you asked in the, in, in the beginning about are equities overvalued or undervalued. The other thing that is unique about this moment in time is that the largest companies are also the most diversified. So the internet has enabled a level of geographic exposure to the leading companies, the S&P 500, that wasn't previously possible. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is that the largest positions that we own are in fact themselves diversified businesses. So we are not having to reach outside of the, so it, it's really between the US and China because in the China, uh, they've made it very clear that Western companies can't come there and compete. And that's an incredible advantage that Chinese companies have. Yep. Now, on the other hand, the rest of the world has not stopped U.S. companies from coming in and competing. And that's why Snapchat is doing so well in India. That's why Europe has had such a hard time with technology innovation is because the U.S. has brought all of its businesses there faster than Europe had the chance to keep them out so that they could innovate their own services. Uh, so I, I, I think even though the fund looks concentrated, yeah. I think it is in fact actually quite diversified because of how diversified some of these large cap players are right now. Mm -hmm. And how do you decide the weightings of the portfolio? Uh, you know, it, I think Facebook's your highest weighted one. How do you, you know, d do these? Yep. Well, f Facebook is, uh, <laughs> they, they've been on, a, they've been on a, a good run here and uh, they've earned their way into that position. They weren't originally our largest holding, but uh, their, their execution um, has been really outstanding. And uh, we try not to sell our winners and, you know, we'll let, we'll let Facebook go to, to where it's naturally going to go. Uh, but when we're picking portfolio positioning uh, at the time of investment, uh, a lot of it comes down to uh, the, uh, the, the, the difference between the potential that we see for the company versus the price that's out there today. So just below Facebook, you see Tencent and Alibaba and with Chinese equities getting, getting so hit for a variety of reasons over the past 12 months. There is a much larger gap between the price you have to pay for the right to those future cash flows uh, versus um, the amount of opportunities that those businesses have in front of them. And that's why they're weighted so heavily uh, in our portfolio right now. 
And if that changes and, you know, if all of a sudden, you know, we see a much bigger discount in the future between, you know, what Google's making today versus what, you know, the price we have to pay for it, uh, the company will be weighted. And is there ever a time where you um, decide to cut a position? I'm assuming yes. And, but, and what would, what would uh, make you do that? So the easy answer on removing positions is the uh, every company that we ever own, and another benefit of running a concentrated portfolio is you keep learning more and more. It's impossible to learn everything about a company before you make your initial investment decision. And public markets are far too competitive um, for you to do three years of research before uh, taking a position. So we view it as you know starting a position in a company is sort of the beginning of the the learning journey. And oftentimes, there'll be businesses where you learn more along the way. I mean, Poshmark was a fun example. I mean, they were a decent IPO. They were a clever company that had a cool niche. We did more and more research on the business. We learned that they weren't quite in as strong of a, as a competitive position as we thought. We actually quite liked what Depop was doing much more than Poshmark. And after doing, initial, after doing further research on it, we said we had started a small position on it. Uh, it didn't, as we learned more, it did not continue to reaffirm our original investment thesis. And we took it out of the portfolio. So those are the, those are the easy ones. Uh, the hard yeah. ones are stocks that perform tremendously. And then you're staring at a high multiple on a company that you like mm -hmm. in an industry that's, that's growing and thriving. And you're not sure what to do with it. And I'll give Pinterest is a great example of this. Pinterest is one of those stocks that was yeah. totally, um, battered down during the uh, uh during the covid shutdowns last march and you know we started steadily adding to our position and that stock was up four or five times in less than 12 months and as an investor you have to look at that and say well did their industry opportunity expand four to five times over this same period because now the price is demanding that that be the case and those are very difficult situations uh, to be in. And what I've found is this is where the beauty of the ETF kicks in, which is we don't have to leave a position entirely. We can pair a quarter of our position or half of our position, and we can do so in a way that doesn't actually trigger taxes to our investors because the magic of the ETF allows you to redeem your securities for other securities. And so this was a great example where we, we were staring at Pinterest and we thought it was a bit overvalued uh, for the niche you know, product that it was running. And we reallocated that into yeah. Baba and Tencent, uh, where prices had not done anything, even though the companies have continued to execute incredibly well. Um, so those are two examples of uh, sell decisions we've made. How often do you rebalance and what drives the decision making there? You've obviously just described one, but other decisions you make on that front? You know, the fun learning on this, I've been a portfolio manager for almost three years now, has been the more that I have been restricted in my ability to trade, uh, the better the fund has performed. When we first started out in the beginning and it was just a privately managed hedge fund and I had, you know, infinite flexibility, that infinite flexibility is, uh, is costly. Uh, so just because you can make changes quickly doesn't mean that you should. And uh, when we went through the process, and I, and I noticed from the very beginning, our trading activity slowed down quite significantly from our early days as, as we've continued to evolve. But that's also benefited from the fact that we've been able to accumulate a lot more research over that time and be much more confident in the individual selections that we have. Uh, but when we were first going through the restructuring from a private fund into a publicly traded ETF, this was back in November and December, uh, there was about a 60-day period there where had I continued to be trading stocks, it would have been really messy. It would have gotten the SEC all confused and it would have put the public listing at risk. So we almost had a 60-day uh, freeze period there and we made sure at the beginning of that period uh, that we were very excited about um, <laughs> if the stock market shut down for 60 days, uh, that we'd still want to own the shares that we did. Uh, and the portfolio did tremendously well uh, over that time. And now that we're not, not a, to, to jump to, you know, we're an actively managed ETF, how often do we really trade it? The exact answer is about every two weeks, uh, we will pursue some changes to the portfolio. 
So that's buying more of names that we own that have gotten beaten up. That's, you know, less commonly we'll pursue the redemption mechanism that I mentioned to you where we want to take some gains out of securities that we where we think the prices have gotten a little frothy. Um, but usually when we're doing that, we're only doing that because we also see another security that we like yep. even more. So that's another way of like answering the sell question better, which is like, we're only starting to pair Pinterest because we actually found other things that we liked right. better. But in an absence of that, you know, we'd otherwise just be writing out, you know, the securities that we own. And when you're assessing positions or taking a position or even like about closing one, are you taking into account any technicals at all? Is it all fundamentally based plus your, obviously all your research that you're doing? You know, at our size, I, I'm very happy to say that we don't have to worry about technicals. Uh, you know, we're, we're a $12 million fund today. Uh, you know, that's six times bigger than we were, uh, you know, 12 months ago. And only until, you know, probably, you know, fingers crossed, if, if we become a, a multi-billion dollar fund manager one day, uh, we will have to care much more about technicals uh, because we get to move in and out of securities without anyone in the market having any idea. But as you get bigger, you do have to be much more careful around volume thresholds, around volatility, around individual price movements. Uh, and so that's something where I think we have the luxury of not having to worry about today. Uh, but it is, a, it is a cost of success in this industry um, as you do get bigger that you do have to factor that in quite a bit. And in terms of a trading strategy, like how would you um, suggest people approach your ETF, when to buy, when to sell? Or should they be holding long periods, uh, you know, what, what should they approach it with? Oh, the Compound Kings yes, ETF? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, what I tell, you know, friends, you know, that have obviously, you know, participated and continue to grow their positions. I like to say, I really enjoy being in the repeat customer business uh, because as an actually managed fund with a very long time horizon, the only advantage that individual investors have over the market is time. There are so many other investors out there that you're competing with on the research side. And so what does that mean that time is your only advantage? That means take your time building any positions that you ever choose to build because you learn more about those securities the longer that you hold them. So the, the, so, so the short answer is take whatever amount you want to invest uh, and take 20% of it and put it in today. And then put in another 20% a month from now mm -hmm. or three months from now or for or whatever period of time that you stretch it out. Uh, because I found that that time advantage works in a number of ways. The market is incredibly volatile. So you're going to find yourself getting in at prices that are occasionally even more attractive than when you started. Uh, you're going to have the benefit of learning more about why a fund like ours owns the securities that we do. And it's going to give you more confidence uh, about that allocation that you're building over time. And so I always just recommend time. I think that every you know great investor that's really uh, been able to differentiate their returns long term against the S and P is they've come up with ways of turning time into their advantage. And there's obviously the Compound Kings ETF. Do you see that as your um, sole ETF? For you know, this is the this is the strategy we believe in, the investment philosophy, and we will build on it and improve on it over time. This will be the ETF that we you know are the only one. Or, or do, are you looking potentially at other areas which which could be interesting, uh, different investment philosophies as well? So we're, I mean, we're all in on Compound Kings. You know, all of my, you know, liquid savings and investments are operating through this vehicle because it's the low cost tax efficient way of managing a portfolio of securities. And in the market that we're in, uh, this is the, the best structure of a fund uh, that we can run out there. So for the foreseeable future, you know, there is not a strategy that we have in mind of, of launching to be a, a brother or sister this into the future. Uh, that said, markets change all the time. And, you know, if yep. five years from now, the Compound Kings has become a, a good and stable strategy and we want to be careful about the fund not getting too big because then we become less nimble, uh, then there very may well be uh, other uh, strategies or actively managed funds that we participate in. But uh, again, I think this is the big difference between actively managed uh, ETFs versus indexes where when all the indexes came out, the incentive for the indexes is to keep throwing more and more sector ideas uh, out there. And the problem with that, as you mentioned in the beginning, you're making investors choose which sectors. And that's 
really hard to do. It's really hard to get that timing yeah. right. It's also really hard to know whether or not any of those companies are ever going to make any money within one of those sectors that you're buying. So the actively managed approach where we get to pull in securities from any sectors, you know, as we deem over time, I think it's just a much more flexible vehicle that doesn't require a potpourri of different ETFs to offer. So, but we've got to prove that, you know, we've got to prove that uh, having a single actively managed fund can really compound well over the next five years. And uh, if we do that well, then, you know, we'll have earned the right to potentially offer another strategy. Yeah. No, I think, I mean, it honestly sounds very, very interesting to me. Um, and the, the focus, I think, is key to success. We hope you're enjoying the episode. For interviews like this every Thursday, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, make sure you give us a star rating and leave guest suggestions along with any other feedback in the review section. Now, back to the show. It'd be really interesting to go through now some of your top sort of holdings in, in the portfolio currently uh, and maybe some details about why you think they're, you know, that as a business, they, they are better than others, uh, potential businesses you could have invested in. Sure. Well, you mentioned Facebook is the largest position. Um, <laughs> We can talk about Facebook for an hour. Uh, I did a, a podcast on just Facebook uh, a few weeks ago with the with the O'Shaughnessy team uh, on the uh, on the business breakdowns. So I would I would just say refer to that for the Facebook investment thesis. <laughs> um, I, I mentioned earlier that we had been reallocating from some you know American uh, internet stocks into the uh, into the Chinese majors and. Um, I'll talk about those for a second. So the challenge with investing in China is that there's, it is still, there are still many aspects of it that are an emerging uh, market, uh, which means that um, free cash flow can be very volatile. It means valuations can be very volatile from very high to very low. And both of those require a little bit more caution when making your security selections there. And we don't, one of the challenges is that there isn't a long list of very high quality securities. Now, because it's been a somewhat unregulated market uh, for the internet giants there, Alibaba and Tencent themselves are actually very diversified companies. So mm -hmm. Alibaba yeah. is in you know, payments and uh, they're in cloud. Uh, and then they have a number of other investments themselves. Uh, Tencent is a little bit more concentrated, but they have a larger investment portfolio. And when we look at both those companies, we don't actually look at them as owning a single stock. I, really, I think both of those stocks individually are the best, call it ETFs that you could possibly own uh, in the China market. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't think that you know, a number of the other offerings where you're having to own a lot of these other companies that have much more speculative outcomes and, and volatile performance are necessarily very strong for a portfolio. So now let's, we got to talk about the, uh, the, the, the regulation heat uh, that has been happening in China um, over the past six months, uh, starting really with the uh, with the Ant Financial restructuring that the government has brought in. You know, if as a long term investor, uh, we actually like it when this type of disruption comes, because a lot of investors go running, and you saw that come to a head in this past week when the Chinese government shut down the, the compulsory education. So the government says, hey, there's a specific curriculum that we have that everyone has to learn here. And they said, you know what? We're not going to allow companies to profit off of the distribution of a required curriculum uh, from the country. And I get it. I mean, the U.S. has pretty similar regulation to that in other areas. Uh, but it spooked the heck out of a ton of investors because the, the great American fear that the Chinese government um, hates uh, billionaires and is going to take all their money away one day is that they now have a living, breathing example of the Chinese government shutting down a company. Now, I don't believe the world is that simple. Um, there, there has been years of capital markets development happening uh, in Asia. And that is certainly a risk. And that is certainly a valuation discount that has to be applied to the securities that you're purchasing there. I do not view investing in China or not investing in China as a binary decision. I view it as a portfolio allocation decision. If China had the democratic government of the United States, 
perhaps 80% of our portfolio would be in their securities given the valuations that they're trading at. But because of these additional risks that we're taking, about 30 to 32% of our portfolio today is allocated to securities there. And to us, given the prices that we're paying, we think that's a fair, uh, that's a fair trade to make uh, given the, the rate of growth and free cash flow generation uh, that they're making. <laughs> we can keep going down this, uh, this hole for a bit, but I'll, I'll stop there for a second. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's funny. So, someone I follow on Twitter, at Macro Charts, uh, posted a chart a couple of days ago of Tencent over the last 16 or so years. Um, and I think there's, he highlighted f- four times that, and this is the fifth, that it's been uh, influenced by something major from the Chinese government, basically. And every time it's happened, it's been the opportunity to have sort of career-defining trades, basically, because it's gone on to absolutely rocket over time. And so basically underlining that, you know, these sort of things can create a huge amount of opportunity uh, in, in the biggest companies, such that, as you said, like Tencent, that you could argue are some, in a sort of a safer area than some of the more speculative plays. It's rare. I, increasingly, I, I have found our, uh, when I look back in our investment strategy and where we have um, experienced the highest returns, it has been buying into those moments of fear. So back in March and April of last year, we were buying restaurant brands and travel platforms, all the things that uh, the world was fearful that this pandemic would potentially wipe out indefinitely. And a year later, a lot of those things aren't so cheap anymore. And the, the great fear of, as we talked about, the, the, the Chinese government you know, smashing its, its, its companies to nothing uh, really came to a head around this education piece. And it was scary. It's, as investors, it's not like we don't feel the fear. We just recognize that it is the fear that results in prices that you rarely get to see. Yeah. And you have to know, you have to, your investment decision really has to be about the price uh, knowing that a lot of these external circumstances are going to be different. And they could be worse, uh, but the cheaper the price, the more flexibility you have over uh, those conditions potentially deteriorating in the future. Mm-hmm. And also a competitive advantage from your point of view is that you've done so much research, you know that companies inside out, you, know, you have a, a much better insight into whether or not this is an opportunity or something to avoid. Yeah. They, you um, prefer to see prices drop on companies you already own because then you get to own more. It's uh, it's a lot more work for us, you know, when when our universe is doing fine, but then there's another universe that's getting totally hammered because it takes us a while to to ramp up the research on all that to ensure that um, we're making educated investments. And are there a few sort of early positions in the portfolio that are in areas uh, you just sort of getting a feeler for uh, entry positions that you can talk about, some innovative areas? We talked earlier about uh, paid subscription media. So after China, you'll see uh, Spotify and Netflix are the next biggest ones in our portfolio. And I mm-hmm. shared a little bit of that earlier um, as to why those stocks have, have gotten beaten up a little bit, but why we're as, as confident. It, it, the crazy thing about both those businesses is that both of their market share positions are continuing to improve. So if you were to just, if, if stocks were to trade off of market share positions alone, uh, those stocks would likely be uh, quite a bit more expensive right now. But they, they trade off of quarter to quarter subscriber editions, which is an incredibly volatile metric. Uh, so yeah. I'd say that's, you know, if, we, if, you're, if you're trading off of year to year market share movements, uh, I think you're going to appreciate the amount of volatility that individual stocks have because it allows you to accumulate um, much more significant uh, positions in them. And then beyond our top, so as I mentioned, we're very concentrated. So our top five stocks are uh, more than 50% of our portfolio. Uh, below that, I'd say we're, we're more focused on sectors that we like. So our, our highest conviction is always in our top five stocks. And then beneath the top five stocks is what are the industries that we like? Uh, and we really like payments. Uh, Adyen is is the largest investment that we have in payments. We really like enterprise software. Uh, ServiceNow is our is our largest investment there. Workday is our follow up. But uh, you know, I'll tell you what we've been spending a lot of time this earnings season around uh, share repurchases versus stock based compensation, and Workday is just really awful about never 
uh, returning capital to shareholders or being strategic about uh, there being uh, drops in share prices. And that, that is very counter uh, to the Compound Kings approach. And yeah. you know, that's a security where we're, you know, we're reaching out to management. We're going to try to get an answer on it. We're looking for it in, in their earnings and their earnings calls. And you know, if we keep grinding out quarters and we don't see management acting in the long-term interest of shareholders, we're going to have to find another uh, enterprise software stock to do that for us. Got you. Um, any on your radar that you can discuss? <laughs> oh, other enterprise software on the radar? Uh, um, enterprise it's, software. Yeah, it's a little early to, uh, to throw any individual names out there. I would say more broadly, I mean, the one other feature that we have is our fund can invest in private companies. And uh, Airbnb was a large private investment for us be- before that became a publicly traded security. And um, although there has been a fever around participating in IPOs and getting some of these late stage private companies, uh, all the good ones have gone public. So the ones that are coming now, I mean, you're getting the bottom of the barrel. Okay. And the bottom of the barrel is somehow getting the, the fluffiest price. So I think the one area that we're, uh, we're greedy about as investors of the next couple of years is like, we've built this little SPAC index. Uh, that industry is going to get, or, or those share prices are going to get rocked and they're going to get rocked all together. And what's interesting about that to us is that there's a couple of quality companies in there. Yeah. And so that's an area where we're on the sidelines, uh, but we are uh, feverishly patient mm-hmm. uh, for, uh, for some of the shakeout that's going to happen. And, uh, try to place a few investments there. And just swinging back to Netflix quickly, um, I was going to ask it earlier, but didn't get a chance. So do you think the, the sort of, is it undervalued because people don't see its potential as a sort of media company of owning to exclusive, exclusive content? Is that where the, the value is going forward, do you think? So um, the fear with um, growth companies like Netflix that have been adding 30 or so million subscribers for, for so many years is that when that number starts to slow, is, is that a leading indicator that there is a technology innovation out there uh, that is grabbing um, time from people? And TikTok has been amazingly successful. Yeah. And the, the short video uh, evolution on mobile, uh, I mean, the US is pretty far behind China, but it's starting to catch up. You heard in, in Mark Zuckerberg's uh, earnings call last night, and he's talked about how more than 50% of the engagement on Facebook is now video, and they're trying to, they're trying to put video everywhere now. Uh, if, if Facebook didn't have such a strong market position uh, in the rest of the world, the rest of the world might be experiencing uh, short-form video as feverishly as China is, uh, where there wasn't a dominant uh, social player already. Yeah. Um, so I think that is, the, that is like the, the hot thing in media, um, but it is, uh, you know, from, from our read on it, it is much more a platform that is taking share away from, say, YouTube than a premium subscription uh, content business like Netflix. Mm-hmm. And so the fear is, well, the subscriber editions are slowing. You're seeing the short form uh, video um, thing take place all over the world. Maybe this whole paid subscription media model, maybe their uh, absolute addressable market isn't quite as big as we originally thought. And um, we're not seeing, we're not seeing uh, Netflix viewers time shift to short form video. So what is the insight that we have that you know, gives us confidence is, well, if their existing subscriber base or the new people signing up are only spending incrementally more time with Netflix as opposed to already beginning to shift some of that time into these short form video assets. Um, well, we can be excited about continuing to buy the asset during a year in which their subscriber number blip because of all this weird COVID stuff that's, that's happening. Yeah. We, we could absolutely still be wrong. And you know, the, it's not the cheapest company in the world. It, it's almost a 5% position for us. It's not a 10% position for us. And back to your early question about weightings, uh, this is where valuation, you know, comes into play in a significant way. Uh, but to us, this is this is the moment to be buying uh, paid subscription media businesses is when they're stumbling on the subscriber counts. Yep. Because the subscriber counts are so volatile that you know there, there's other things that make these businesses valuable long term. Mm-hmm. And we're obviously 
in the middle of earnings season. Pretty big week this week. Um, the podcast will be going out a week or so after this, but you know we're, we're in the middle of it at the moment. Um, what's your take on this earnings season? Some people were worried that growth rates would start to slow. Maybe it would affect overall indices. Um, so the market might you know, be affected by it. It seems like we've, we've started on not such a bad foot. Um, Tesla had record growth, I believe, but you know, uh, much bigger than people have thought. Um, what's your take on it? So, uh, yeah, everyone's, everyone, every company is out there trying to lower everyone's expectations for the second half. And the, uh, it was interesting to see some of the categories. So hardware clearly slowed. So Apple, uh, Xbox, Surface, uh, all of the, you know, the toys that people purchase during shutdowns, uh, they're having a hard time comping uh, those, uh, those quarters. Um, in the advertising side, you know, social media has continued to be really strong. Uh, Facebook's obviously trying to temper expectations like they always do. A search definitely surprised us a bit. I mean, for as poorly as Google performed uh, during the shutdowns, it is a bit remarkable how quickly they've recovered. Yeah. Uh, a lot of that appears to be driven by travel, uh, which is a, I, so I think we've learned a little bit of how exposed Google is to travel advertising uh, by seeing how much yeah. their numbers have swung uh, during this crisis. But even, I mean, even Bing, Microsoft's, you know, crappy search engine, they were up like 53% uh, in the quarter. And that tells you a lot about the, the, the industry itself uh, just saw uh, a pretty substantial uh, rebound. Uh, so those were those were the big headlines uh, from the tech majors. Uh, we've always been looking at China as being a quarter or two ahead of the U.S. Uh, coming out of the lockdowns. So with the S&P 500 being as expensive as it is, with companies talking down numbers in the second half, if this China as a preview to the U.S. is a quarter or two ahead, that does spell a little bit of doom uh, for U.S. securities um, in this, call it the the later stage coming out of the pandemic. But I, you know, as, as you've probably picked up from you know, our conversation so far, uh, we don't ever make our investment decisions off of what we think is going to happen. Uh, you know, we take the data that's in front of us and try to buy things at the best price that we can find them. And you talked about investing in innovation. Um, is this a good time to invest in innovation based on the valuations that we're seeing at the moment? I think it's a tricky time to invest in innovation. I think, uh, I think there are a lot of um, really well-marketed IPOs um, or smaller companies that are you know, trying to claim ownership of categories. I mean, the number of, I mean, I, there's a, a uh, blockchain uh, Bitcoin ETF that launched the other day, and it basically owns all of these uh, Canadian companies that basically own Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. which is a, a real funny backdoor way of buying Bitcoin through a uh, publicly traded ETF. So the challenge here is buying expensive, non-cash flow generating small cap securities is not the only way to participate in innovation. Companies all across the capital structure, all across different countries, offer ways to invest in innovation. And I think that Innovation as a theme has gotten arrested by a bit, by a small group of high revenue growth. And that to me is a very dangerous proposition because those same themes that may or may not benefit some of those small companies are absolutely themes that larger players in incumbent industries are absolutely pursuing. So I think the, the whole investing in innovation concept is, is much more complicated than uh, is currently being offered. And uh, the prices that we're seeing in the new upstart, I mean, I, I mentioned our fund 18 months ago, uh, we, our, our largest positions were Pinterest, Airbnb, and Etsy. And today our largest positions are Alibaba, Tencent, and Facebook. And that is a reflection yeah. of how far we think the market has run in some more of those pure play innovation providers versus the type of return uh, that's being offered in the large cap players. So when I think about innovation, I never think about a single security or fund as offering me access to that innovation. I think more about within an industry, how is this potentially changing some of the business models? 
And are the larger incumbent players just as well positioned to adapt to that piece of technology or innovation as some new emerging player might be? Negative cash flow growth generating companies. Mm -hmm. And are there any innovation themes that we haven't already discussed perhaps that you're, that's on your watch list and why? I mean, we're big blockchain fans. A anyone that works in finance has got to yeah. be pumped about it. Uh, I would love nothing more than, I mean, we like the democratic approach. We run a publicly traded hedge fund for all intents and purposes. Uh, but that publicly traded hedge fund is pretty limited to U.S. investors uh, on American stock exchanges that trade from 9.30 to 4 p.m. Eastern. And man, when there is a blockchain distributed uh, fund uh, where you get access to the investor that trades globally 24-7, that makes a hell of a lot more sense to me than this extremely rigid structure of uh, only trading on an individual exchange. So I, I'm very excited about what a technology like that can do for my own industry long term. Uh, I had been digging into it over the past month or two to figure out how close we are to potentially offering it. Uh, it's, it's a ways off. I mean, right now things are moving backwards a little bit. Uh, so the tokenization of you know, Apple and Tesla, um, yeah, you know, the, the exchanges are moving away from that because the SEC came in and said, hey, we're going to treat those as New York Stock Exchange regulated securities. And they said, they said fine, we're not going to do it anymore. Uh, I think the real, because what you could have done is you could have offered a, basically a coin that is a collection of other coins where we do the same job, where we're picking weightings uh, for our investments. Uh, but if those token coins aren't available, then there's nothing for me to build a fund around. I think one of the, one of the interesting innovations that, that may come there is to figure out how crypto-based uh, investors can sit on a cap table alongside you know, private market investors or public market investors. Because if you were to think about like a convertible preferred security today, that is in essence an alternative security that has a cap table position alongside a ton of public shareholders that basically own common stock that's traded on the New York Stock Exchange. Now, you know, why couldn't a position like why couldn't there be an ownership position in a publicly traded company that belongs to crypto oriented investors? And I think somewhere in there is is how this will get um, built out long term, but uh, we're not there yet. Wow. Yeah, that, that is very interesting, isn't it? Do you think that's um, what's the most interesting innovation in that area? Do you think that's on the horizon? Maybe not so far as what you're saying, because that seems like you know quite a lot of regulation stuff. Uh, I think the the I think in the interim, I think what blockchain is clearly why the Ethereum has done so well in the first six months of this year is that the banking traditional banking products of uh, lending and borrowing are currently the features that are being built into crypto. Um, I think that's the area where we're early. It's like if, you know, if Bitcoin <laughs> did the first thing of just you know, providing a gold alternative, uh, we're in the early days of now seeing um, borrowing, and, um, uh, borrowing and lending products. And that, it's a very fascinating yep. uh, place to follow because I, I think it's, it's going to continue to be a very volatile sector, but the technology is just too powerful to ignore uh, and it is going to, you know, change a lot of legacy financial institutions. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. That's, um, do you think regulation needs to come first for this to really? So, I mean, there's a lot of money in it already doing various things. Um, oh, regulation! It, they, they just take too long. Like it's <laughs> yeah. the entrepreneurs here are moving so much faster. Yeah, they're still trying to figure out how to regulate Bitcoin. And, you know, Bitcoin may get some regulation in a couple of years from now before they're even able to move on to like the, the borrowing and lending products. Yeah. Uh, so I, yeah, regulation is always going to be playing catch. I mean, look at Facebook. Facebook still hasn't gotten regulated. So I think there's, I think there's plenty of window left. Awesome. Well, Robert, I mean, it's been great to chat with you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we covered a we covered a lot of ground, Ed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been good. Um, uh, yeah, really, really interesting to see the innovation that's happening in this the, the act of investing in ETFs space. It's, I mean, it's the first um, person we've had on the show to talk about that, and I mean, you, you can see it, like you said, through through Ark Invest and and how they've sort of brought that forward. For many people, probably is is the right strategy. You know, a lot of retail investors, you know, are not going to be as good as professionals do, are doing it 
day in, day out. So it, it just makes sense. Yeah. And that's that's how I think about what is so cool about the actively managed ETF is that, yes, Kathy is selling innovation, but what she's really doing is she's selling access to Kathy. And if you like what she says and the investment decisions that she makes, although she sold the Chinese stocks the other day, I don't know why she did that. Mm-hmm. Um, then her fund, her publicly traded ETFs give you access to what she's doing. And that to me is what I think is the, the next wave in ETFs are because Compound Kings is the way to access, you know, what I'm doing and the team that I'm building here at Upholdings to, you know, make that fund perform as well as we can. Uh, yeah. So I think, yeah, I think you've said it well, which is the, it's, it's a vehicle that is enabling access uh, to the managers as opposed to historically just offering a sector or an index. Mm-hmm. And it'd be great to see, you know, see these managers become uh, as big as they could potentially can in this world. And where can people follow your insight and uh, get more information about the ETF upholdings, et cetera? Um, I, honestly, we, we're actually pr- quite active on Twitter. Uh, so the upholdings account on Twitter, uh, we, we, we push a lot of research there. We test a lot of ideas. Mm-hmm. And we get a lot of great feedback as well. I think the, the FinTwick community is incredibly strong. Uh, so we're uh, we're trying to be both contributors uh, as well as uh, recipients over there. So I'd, I'd, I'd start there uh, and then you'll be able to find everything else. Awesome. Well, thanks, Robert. It's been a great talk. Yeah, great chatting with you. Thanks for listening, everyone. Just a quick note before we sign off. If you're looking for an easily digestible daily update on the markets, this might be of interest. Opto Updates is our short newsletter sent every day during the trading week, giving you a bulleted list of the top seven stories from the global stock markets. We've done the hard work for you, highlighting relevant opportunities and trends. And in addition, we'll also keep you notified of any new products, stock reports, or webinars from the Opto world. If you're interested, sign up using the link in the show notes. And thanks also to CoFruition for consulting on and producing the show. Until next time. Co-fruition.